Okay, I'm hitting the button. Well, good morning to everyone and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, reminder that next week we have our very special Goldman Berlin lectureship and we will be hearing the talk Reclaiming Language to Reclaim the Practice of Medicine given by Dr. Sunita Puri from University of Southern California. And we are here on the Teams Live platform with our virtual viewership for Grand Rounds, a combined effort of Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland Medical Center. Uh, for now, our viewership remains virtual, so though stay tuned for limited live attendance. And you can earn CME credit for watching this video, uh, for watching live or watching the recording on video, which is available via the same link as the invite for today's talk. Uh, I will be monitoring the Q&A throughout today's session, so please go ahead and post your comments and your questions. I'll mostly save them to the end and then address them to our speaker as time permits. And now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Hutchinson. She is a hospital medicine physician at Providence Portland Medical Center. Dr. Hutchinson earned her medical degree from OHSU and then did internal medicine residency at Providence Portland, where she went on to serve as chief resident. She was originally scheduled to speak last spring, um, which was derailed by COVID-19, and we are absolutely delighted to have her back now to give her new talk um, covering various aspects of iron deficiency anemia. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to be here today. And um, I've um, had the pleasure of enjoying many grand rounds, um, both in the prior live and now also the Teams format. So I'm uh, glad that I get to be here today to talk about um, a topic that I've uh, been really interested in and learned a lot about um, preparing for this talk today and excited to share some of the things that I've uh, learned and reviewed today with you guys. Um, so I don't have any disclosures. Um, as far as disclaimers, um, as mentioned, I'm a general hospitalist doctor. Um, certainly um, going to be bringing you uh, information that um, I hope you can feel that you can trust. It's all from uh, mostly uh, sources such as the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and then a lot of this is from um, Dr. Um, Auerbach, who is a world-renowned expert in iron deficiency management. He's literally um, written hundreds and hundreds of papers about this topic and the management of iron deficiency. Um, he's the author of all the up-to-date um, chapters on iron deficiency as well, and um, just kind of a legend in this field. Um, so uh, getting started, um, in terms of objectives for today, I'm going to um, take a brief amount of time to uh, review some historical syndromes um, associated with iron deficiency, and then I'll jump into uh, talking about the pathophysiology of iron metabolism. Uh, we'll talk about the role of hepcidin in iron homeostasis, um, iron deficiency presentation and diagnosis, um, as well as identifying iron deficiency in anemia of chronic disease, causes of iron deficiency, pros and cons of oral versus IV iron, and indications for IV iron. Um, and then towards the end of the talk, I'm gonna um, go through some myths and facts and some uh, brief highlights from uh, literature updates on these topics. So um, we'll talk about frequency of oral iron administration. Is vitamin C actually needed with oral iron to absorb it better? Um, brief note on iron overload risk, and then kind of a couple uh, points about IV iron and heart failure, IV iron and anaphylaxis risk, and IV iron and infection. So um, super briefly, but I kind of wanted to start from the very beginning about how about iron in our environment. So iron is everywhere. Um, it's the chief constitute of the Earth's core and one of the most abundant elements on Earth in meteorites, the sun, stars, and the surface of Mars. Pictured here is a huge meteorite in Southern Africa, um, composed almost entirely of iron and weighing 66 tons. Iron helps produce chlorophyll in plants, and um, as we know, it's critical for biological functions, DNA synthesis, as well as cell proliferation. 
So what about iron in history? Well, humans have known about iron for a very, very long time. Um, and so, uh, you know, back to, um, you know, we have found evidence of, um, there's, uh, of iron being used in prehistoric times. Uh, there's some iron beads here pictured in the upper left-hand photo. And those are found from an Egyptian burial site and they were made of meteorite iron um, dating back to 3200 BC. Um, and then as we know, um, there was also a, a prehistorical uh, age called the Iron Age dating back to 1000 to 500 BC, which was characterized by mass production of tools and weapons smelted from smelted iron into steel. And those, the picture on the bottom is actually a set of iron house keys. So I just kind of thought this was fascinating. Um, but you know, what about, how long have we known about iron deficiency affecting humans? Um, well, the earliest, um, you know, this kind of goes all the way back to when have we, when do, when was, when was anemia and iron deficiency actually discovered? Well, um, uh, Anthony Van Leeuwen, Leeuwenhock um, first identified blood cells in the 18th century. And then um, iron was identified in blood after Mangini in the 18th century burnt blood to ash. He found iron particles. Um, in the left bottom corner, um, Paul Ehrlich, who has a fascinating um, uh, career, he developed aniline dyes and he used them to identify blood cell morphology in blood smears. And then um, in the 1920s, Helen McKay in the bottom right hand corner here, um, she was really fundamental to kind of um, where we are today in terms of um, evaluating for iron deficiency and treating iron deficiency. Um, she studied hemoglobin levels in children in England um, to determine what the normal values were and did early studies using iron supplementation in anemic children. And um, there's some interesting kind of historical uh, syndromes uh, that are thought to be associated with iron deficiency. Uh, some of them that we know about and uh, one in particular I had not heard about before, but um, uh, this is kind of one of the oldest evidence, some of the oldest evidence we see of iron deficiency in humans. And this is um, called parotid hyperostosis. And basically it's characteristic cranial vault lesions related to iron deficiency. And, um, you know, it resembles cranial changes that we see in some severe anemias related to hereditary anemia, like thalassemia. Um, but these, these were found in human remains um, in Northern Europe. Um, and the and Americas that were uh, from agricultural societies that were dependent on maize, which is known to be historically uh, iron poor food. Um, there is a syndrome called chlorosis, and um, it was first described in the 1500s and kind of disappeared, I guess, in the 19th century, but a very controversial disease that was predominantly seen in women. And it was um, a syndrome that was characterized by sallow complexion, palpitations, shortness of breath, fatigue, um, and often associated uh, with dyspepsia or a menstrual disorder. And, um, you know, lab draws weren't very common at this time, but um, in, uh, in cases it was associated with a hypochromic anemia and hypothesized to be secondary to iron deficiency. And treatment often included iron supplements or something called Charlie Beat Waters, which we'll talk about in a second. There's Plummer Vinson syndrome, um, which you know most of us are probably have heard about or familiar with, and maybe some have seen. Um, but this was a syndrome that was first identified in the 1930s um, as a triad of microcytic anemia, dysphagia, and esophageal web, um, and associated with iron deficiency. And um, also in, in the 1930s achlorhydric anemia or atrophic gastritis um, resulting from an inability to produce gastric, asterisk, gastric acid leading to hypochromic microcytic anemia, poor appetite. And you know we often see this now in patients who have been taking PPIs or in pernicious anemia, sometimes in H. pylori infection or in severe hypothyroidism. Um, so what about th um, these chally beet waters going back to this? Um, so uh, these are iron containing waters um, that have been recognized for healing properties since prehistoric times. And treatment was long, um, was recommended long before iron deficiency was understood. Um, in the 17th century, these springs in England and Italy were 
thought to um, toted to cure colic, melancholy, and the vapors, which I mean, some of those symptoms you might see in iron deficiency, but I um, thought that was really fascinating. And then um, iron supplementation has been around for a very long time, again, before labs were commonly done um, or before people were uh, you know, really being clearly diagnosed with iron deficiency. But I found tons of historic ads for iron supplements, and these were some of the the ones I really liked, uh, Dr. Mott's Chalabit pills, and then um, Carter's iron pills for blood, nerves, and complexion. And the ad for Carter's pills was, I know how you feel, weak back, trembling, palpitation, headache, I've had all, but thanks to Carter's iron pills, I'm fully restored. I can guarantee they'll do as much for you. What about, um, now that we've touched on some uh, history and background for um, iron deficiency, what about iron deficiency today? So um, iron deficiency is exceedingly prevalent and affects, you know, really billions of people throughout the world. Um, in developing countries, um, iron deficiency is thought to mainly um, be related to things like dietary or um, malnutrition, and then intestinal worms as well. Um, hookworm infections are, are still an, an exceedingly high cause of iron deficiency in developing countries. Um, high income countries, iron deficiency is typically associated with chronic blood loss, um, malabsorption syndromes, and also, to a lesser extent, um, dietary or malnutrition causes. So um, just to kind of get some terms and definitions out of the way before we move on uh, to make sure we're on the same page. Um, iron deficiency can just be low iron stores without the development of anemia, meaning that the hemoglobin and hematocrit levels are normal, but the iron stores are low. Iron deficiency anemia is low iron stores with resultant anemia. Anemia of chronic inflammation is basically an anemia that is multifactorial um, and is due to abnormal iron homeostasis. And this is <clears throat> this results from you know inflammation leading to increased cytokines and upregulation <clears throat> of a peptide hormone hepcidin, which <clears throat> we'll go into more in just a moment. Anemia of chronic disease um, is anemia that's due to decreased kidney production of erythropoietin. Um, then there's another term to be familiar with: absolute iron deficiency. And this is iron, this is absence or severely reduced iron stores. Um, and then there's functional iron deficiency. And um, this is also called iron restricted erythropoiesis. And this, um, a, this is when iron stores are either insufficient or they're not accessible. Like a, a, an individual might have iron, but it just cannot be accessed. And this is commonly seen in patients with anemia of chronic disease or in patients using. Um, erythropoietin stimulating agents. Um, in terms of iron metabolism, uh, just going through this briefly, uh, typical iron requirements, they vary throughout our life cycle and they vary between men and women. Um, I saw multiple kind of differing uh, iron requirements in my review, but um, uh, from this article from the New England Journal, it's thought that you know for adults and um, Typical iron requirements are about 20 to 25 milligrams per day. Iron is absorbed in uh, the small bowel, typically the duodenum, and we only absorb about one to two milligrams of iron per day. And we lose about two milligrams of iron from cell turnover and mucosal sloughing per day. Most of the iron um, is provided from recycled red blood cells um, or is from stores from our liver, macrophages, and to a lesser extent, muscle. Um, hepcidin is a peptide hormone from the liver that controls iron homeostasis and is a key player um, in causing things like uh, anemia of chronic disease. So going deeper into kind of the pathophysiology of iron metabolism, when we eat something with iron, um, we, when iron is ingested, it's in the ferric state. Um, and then it's reduced to its ferrous form um, in the stomach. There's two receptors um, that transport iron into the enterocyte. Um, and there's one for heme, which means um, for, there's one for heme and non-heme iron. 
and that uh, the heme iron receptor is much more avid for iron. And this is um, this receptor is uh, for um, iron that's from animal sources, like from meat, poultry, or fish. Um, the receptor that takes non-heme iron from vegetable sources is far less avid for iron. Um, so when iron is transported into the enterocyte, um, it either binds to ferritin or it's transported into the bloodstream by ferroportin, a transport protein. Um, and then transferrin uh, transports iron into the blood to be used for making hemoglobin or for storage. And so um, circling back um, to hepcidin and iron homeostasis, um, as I mentioned before, hepcidin is a peptide hormone that's it's made in the liver. Um, it's also known to be an acute phase reactant. Um, when there's inflammation, the liver re uh, releases hepcidin, and hepcidin um, can basically block absorption um, from the gastrointestinal tract of iron. Um, and it can also block the release of iron from macrophages as well. So um, hepcidin is key for adjusting fluctuate to fluctuations in plasma iron. And it's activated um, by high iron levels so that we don't absorb too much iron. Um, it's also activated by inflammation, as I mentioned, um, and infection. Um, hepcidin levels will be low appropriately when um, the serum iron is low, like in cases of iron deficiency. Um, or in uh, other cases where you're having high erythropoiesis or tissue hypoxia. Uh, physical signs and symptoms of iron deficiency. I think you know most of us are pretty familiar with the subjective symptoms that a patient might present with. And I think some of the physical exam findings uh, might be a little um, more rare, uh, but uh, patients commonly with severe iron deficiency or an even mild iron deficiency report fatigue, feeling generally weak, um, dyspnea, poor concentration can be associated with iron deficiency, um, restless leg syndrome, pica, uh, pallor. And then there's some images here at the top one on the left of atrophic glossitis. And then in the right hand corner at the top, angular chelitis, and then there's the nail changes here seen on the bottom that can be associated um, with severe iron deficiency, the kind of characteristic spooning. Uh, a brief note on pica. Um, pica, as we're probably familiar with, is um, basically a compulsion to eat non-food substances. Uh, it's derived from Latin for magpie, um, a bird that gathers non-food objects. Um, patients who develop this syndrome from iron deficiency, you know, commonly we see them eating ice, which is called pagophagia, um, but you might see them eat other non-food substances such as clay, um, dirt, coffee grounds, raw rice or pasta, or even chalk. So, in terms of diagnosing iron deficiency, I have an algorithm here, and I'm sure you're familiar with kind of, uh, this is a, just actually from up to date, but I thought was an important to touch on briefly here. Um, we can diagnose iron deficiency with the serum ferritin alone if it's low. Um, ferritin is very sensitive and specific, 92% sensitive and 98% specificity in diagnosing iron deficiency if it's less than 30. Um, however, a very important point is that um, ferritin may be falsely normal, um, especially in cases of inflammation, the ferritin might not be low. And so if you suspect iron deficiency, um, further workup should be done with iron studies and evaluation of transferrin saturation um, to see if there truly is iron deficiency. Uh, this is kind of a, a very big table. I'm going to uh, go through things here one at a time and then kind of summarize it on the next slide, the important point I want to take away from it. Um, I just felt kind of obligated to go over uh, typical iron indices for um, normal values, those seen in iron deficiency anemia, uh, those in anemia of chronic inflammation, 
and then when there's iron deficiency with anemia of chronic inflammation. Um, so the first uh, column is just going over normal values with normal hemoglobin being greater than 12 in women and 13 in men, and um, MCV uh, mean uh, Kirkups, sorry, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing that right now. Uh, MCV values between usually about 80 and 100, um, and then iron levels between um, 10 and 30, and then ferritin uh, normal values listed there, and normal transferrin saturation values listed there as well. Um, however, in iron deficiency, um, typically the hemoglobin is low, the MCV is low, the iron is low, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, the ferritin is typically less than 30 and the transferrin saturation is less than 16. In anemia of chronic inflammation, again, um, hemoglobin is usually low, the MCV may be low normal, iron is usually low, and the transferrin saturation is low normal, but the ferritin is usually elevated. Um, so that's usually how I kind of remember anemia of chronic inflammation, that everything is pretty much low except for the ferritin. Um, in terms of anemia of chronic inflammation when there's iron deficiency as well, and I feel like this is um, exceedingly common in patients in the hospital and probably many of the patients we care for in the clinic and environment, um, you typically see, again, low hemoglobin, the MCV may be low, the iron is low, um, the ferritin is um, often less than 100, but again, we can't exclude um, iron deficiency in anemia of chronic inflammation just by the ferritin alone, um, you'd want to verify that the trans, um, ferrins, look at the transferrin saturation. Um, because oftentimes in cases like anemia of chronic kidney disease or in heart failure, the ferritin may be higher than 100, but iron deficiency is still present. And you can verify that by looking at the transferrin saturation being less than 20. So the main point I want you to take away from that giant table <laughs> is that iron deficiency anemia can be diagnosed with a ferritin alone on less than 30 or a transferrin saturation of less than 16. However, when there's iron deficiency and anemia of chronic disease combined, um, you can typically make the diagnosis with the ferritin being less than 100 or the transferrin saturation being less than 20%. And this is um, uh, commonly seen in all the heart failure trials that we use um, looking at treatment of heart failure, iron deficiency and heart failure. These, these are the values they use, a ferritin less than 100 or a transferrin saturation less than 20%. When you look at the data um, in patients with chronic kidney disease and an end-stage renal disease, they use a much higher level for ferritin cutoffs. They might use a level um, of ferritin of 100 for CKD and at times even up to 500. Um, and the transferrin saturation they use is usually 20 to 30%. Um, so those are just the main numbers I want you to take away uh, for really thinking about um, making the diagnosis of iron deficiency within anemia of chronic disease. Um, what about some other tests for iron deficiency? Um, you know, the reticulocyte count or reticulocyte um, count index um, is usually low um, in, in iron deficiency anemia, and that reflects hypoproliferation. Uh, the peripheral smear. Um, which is shown here on the top image, shows a micro, microcytic hypochromic um, anemia. And, um, you know, the gold standard is a, a bone marrow aspirate. I, I've never made the diagnosis with higher deficiency myself that way. Um, but on the slide on the left um, shows a bone marrow that is absent of iron stores. And the one on the right shows um, the blue color, and, and that shows that there is iron stores in that sample. Other things to kind of, other clues, I guess, um, sometimes the platelet count um, might be very high actually in iron deficiency anemia. So um, that's something to be aware of when you're seeing thrombocytosis is the cause that is, is that person iron deficient. Um, and then I think another test that we've heard a lot more of recently is something called the soluble transferrin receptor. And um, this can be helpful uh, in cases where iron deficiency is challenging to sort out. Um, really, in my review of diagnosing iron deficiency, when it can be tricky, such in cases, such in cases when a patient has anemia of chronic disease as well as iron deficiency, it seems to me that using the ferritin and the transferrin saturation um, is uh, is useful enough. But there can be 
cases where specialists might think about using the soluble transferrin receptor, um, which uh, is not affected by inflammation. Um, and it's, uh, if it comes back high, then that is reflective of iron deficiency. However, this is not a perfect test either. Um, it can be inaccurate in patients using um, erythropoietin stimulating agents. Um, other things can skew the lab results like if a patient's hemolyzing. So um, again, no test is perfect. And I, I, I think we can order this at Providence, but um, I don't think the test results are as quick as getting a ferritin or iron indices. I, I actually have never ordered this test. Um, so iron deficiency uh, management, um, I think importantly, I'm gonna go over searching for the cause of the iron deficiency, and then we'll talk about treatment. Uh, so I kind of talked about um, typical causes of iron deficiency in developing um, uh, culture uh, in, develop in, the, in the beginning of the talk here, um, but kind of going a little bit more into detail here. So um, causes of iron deficiency, it can be physiologic or due to increased demand, um, such in cases of infancy and childhood or rapid growth, um, menstrual losses or pregnancy. Um, iron deficiency can be due to environmental causes, such as diet, um, like in cases specifically of malnutrition, or in a patient who has an extremely iron-restricted diet, such as in very strict vegetarians who don't use supplementation. Um, iron deficiency can be pathologic um, due to uh, trouble with absorption in the small bowel, maybe because a patient has a history of um, gastric bypass surgery. Um, it can be due to infection like H. pylori um, or celiac disease, um, atrophic gastritis, um, or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, path other pathologic causes that we see commonly are due to chronic blood loss, um, often from the GI tract, um, but it can also be genital urinary. Um, intravascular hemolysis is another less common cause. Um, exercise induced, uh, there are cases of athletes becoming iron deficient. Um, and this is actually thought to really just be due to occult GI bleeding typically. Um, and then as we mentioned before, that parasitic causes of um, chronic blood loss and iron deficiency are very common um, in developing countries. Uh, other things, iatrogenic, um, frequent la lab draws potentially, um, and then also blood donation. Drug-related causes from PPIs, and then medications that might make you more at risk for occult GI bleeding, um, such as NSAIDs, aspirin, or steroids. Um, there can be genetic causes of iron deficiency, and there's um, a mutation of uh, this uh, TMPRSS6 mutation that basically um, leads to chronically high levels of hepcidin, um, which, as we mentioned before, when hepcidin levels are high, you're just not going to be able to absorb iron. It's blocking iron absorption in the GI tract, and it's also preventing um, release of iron from stores and macrophages, too. So with those patients, you give them iron, but they just don't improve. Um, and then there's iron-restricted erythropoiesis. Um, and we see this again in cases where um, there's iron, but it's just not accessible. Cases of chronic kidney disease, anemia of chronic inflammation, and use of um, erythropoietin stimulating agents. Um, so just a brief note on iron and diet. Um, Iron is in a lot of uh, different foods that we eat all the time. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a, a heme um, receptor and a non-heme iron receptor on our uh, small bowel enterocytes. Uh, and the heme iron receptor is much more avid for absorbing sources of iron from animal products. Um, and this is, you know, one of the reasons why people who are strict vegetarians who might not be eating a very iron-rich diet may be more at risk for developing iron deficiency. But there is a lot of iron in, um, in vegetable foods, like uh, spe specifically like uh, beans and uh, lentils and green leafy vegetables. And there's a lot of iron in fortified cereals, bread and pastas, as well as things like dried fruits, too. So um, going into treatment of um, 
of iron. And I guess like specifically one other note before I go into kind of treatment of iron is um, I just reviewed uh, all the different causes of possible iron deficiency. And first and foremost, the, the cause of the iron deficiency must be identified. Um, it has to, to be worked up. We cannot just give these patients, um, you know, oral or IV iron without identifying the cause of why they're iron deficient. Um, and so in, for, in most cases, um, especially in uh, patients who are, if they're uh, postmenopausal women, they, they definitely need a GI evaluation. And most men, they're going to need a GI evaluation. So uh, history and often referral uh, is, is indicated for finding a cause of bleeding in these patients. So treatments, um, as far as um, oral iron, there are so many bottles, like when you go to the pharmacy or you go to the, the grocery store, or the pharmacy, there are so many different formulations of oral iron. Um, they come in multiple preparations and you'll see multiple different doses on the bottles and it can be all very confusing about which iron supplement to select. Um, but generally, all forms are considered effective. Um, there, one, the iron pills that have that are enterically coated or say sustained release are thought actually, you know, patients seem to maybe sometimes gravitate towards those because of the possible side effects from oral iron being GI upset or constipation. Um, but those formulations are thought actually um, that are enteric coated or sustained release are thought to be poorly absorbed um, due to being uh, basically absorbed, released in the distal intestine, distal to the site of where iron is absorbed in the duodenum. Um, so I've kind of just listed some of the basic iron formulations here on the left and how much iron is in each of them. And again, even though like they're saying that there's 65 milligrams of elemental iron, for example, in ferrous sulfate, you're only gonna absorb so much of that from that iron supplementation. Um, and iron comes in, uh, you know, not only pills and capsules, but also liquid form, formulations and gummy bears and all sorts of things. So multiple different choices for oral iron. Um, but uh, oftentimes, you know, we give patients oral iron and sometimes their, their uh, anemia or their iron deficiency doesn't correct. And so why are reasons why oral iron supplementation might fail? Um, you know, clearly, obviously the patient's not taking it would be a reason. Um, if they're not absorbing it, maybe due to the enteric coating I mentioned, or if they're taking antacids, or if they have a malabsorb malabsorbative condition. Um, uh, maybe that we haven't stopped the source, the blood loss. Uh, if they're still having a lot of bleeding, um, it's going to look like the oral iron isn't working. Um, or maybe we don't have the right diagnosis. Um, maybe there's something else causing the anemia. Uh, maybe they have inflammation leading to anemia of chronic disease or an infection, malignancy, or some other nutritional deficiency like B12 or folate. Other things that can inhibit absorption of iron. Um, you know, iron is best absorbed when it's taken without food um, in a mildly acidic medium. Uh, things that can block absorption are um, coffee and tea and I think that's mostly the tannins that are thought to interfere with absor absorption. Also, calcium-containing foods and supplements can be an issue, like if um, a patient is taking Tums or something like that, or probably avoid taking their calcium with a glass of milk would be best to be avoided. Um, but antacids can also um, block absorption of iron as well, or inhibit it, rather. And then, you know, treatment of IV iron, going through this, um, there are a lot of formulations of IV iron and, um, you know, one, there's studies that look at these head to head and my, from my reading, it's not that one iron, IV iron is not thought to be better than the other. Um, I think it's basically things you have to think about is what's available at your institution. Um, what is the cost and, um, how many doses does your patient need? Um, I've list, listed a several IV formulations on the left, and the top three are ones that I know that we can administer at Providence Portland. So um, ferrogluconate, iron sucrose, which is also called venifer, and then the low molecular weight iron dextrin. Those are all formulations that we have at Providence. And I've listed the costs um, on the right side here. Um, but in my, you know, the thing that's kind of nice is I think with 
um, the low molecular weight iron dextran, you can give a thousand milligrams um, for a patient. And while it is the most expensive formulation that I've listed here at $370 per dose, um, you only need one dose. So, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, patients need about a thousand milligrams of iron to replace their iron stores. And so if you were gonna give them an alternative source of IV iron, like venifer, I'd have to give them three doses of venifer to give, get the same amount in one dose of IV low molecular weight iron dextran. So, you know, I think if this is something you're doing in the hospital, you know, the patient is gonna be in the hospital for several days, it's totally reasonable to do kind of a couple days of iron sucrose if you're trying to totally replete their iron stores. Um, versus if you know that they're discharging that day, you might just want to give them one dose of low molecular weight iron dextran. Um, I also included um, just uh, ferric carboxymaltose at the bottom, and that's one that can also be given um, uh, at a high dose in a short amount of time. Um, and that one is a more commonly, I think, used in Europe. Um, but it's, it's not on formulary at Providence as far as I know, I haven't been able to find it. Um, and as far as calculating how much IV iron to give a patient, um, you can calculate this easily by just Googling M MD calc and looking up this Gandoni equation. Um, and this is really the fastest way to do it, but you basically just enter the patient's weight in what their target hemoglobin is and what their hemoglobin is on presentation and it will calculate the patient's iron deficit. Um, so I use kind of an example here of a 70 kilogram woman who had a target hemoglobin of 12 and um, her hemoglobin on presentation was eight. And so it calculated that she needs about a thousand milligrams of iron um, to correct her iron stores. Um, so talking about um, IV iron and safety, um, I think a lot of us are hesitant to give IV iron because of risks for possible side effects with administration of IV iron. Um, but severe reactions are actually exceedingly rare, and they were more associated um, with high molecular weight iron dextran, which is no longer on the market. Um, and that high weight um, molecular that high molecular weight I, 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 iron dextran also had cases of anaphylaxis. So I think that's where a lot of the anxiety and fear comes with giving IV iron. Um, when patients do, if they do have a, a side effect from giving, getting an IV um, transfusion of iron, it's typically thought to be an infusion reaction and less likely an allergic reaction. And there's been studies that have looked at this by checking like tryptase levels to assess if the patient's actually having an allergic reaction. And the tryptase levels, um, which would be high in an allergic reaction, have been shown to be low in these cases. Um, additionally, these adverse reactions to transfusion are also thought to be exceedingly low. Um, and expert opinion says that we should not be pre-medicating these patients unless they have a history of um, uh, asthma, multiple drug allergies, and actually it should be considered sometimes in patients who have inflammatory arthritis because it can cause a flare of that. Um, the transfusion reaction that can occur if it does um, is called a fishbane reaction. And there's a picture of the gentleman here on the top and then at the bottom after it resolved. But on the top, you can kind of see he's a little bit flushed. Um, patients can um, have fevers, report palpitations and myalgias. Um, again, this is seen in, um, thought to occur in less than 1% of IV iron um, infusions. And it typically resolves, which is pausing the infusions, and patients then can be restarted at a slower rate and usually tolerate the infusion okay. Um, in more severe cases, if it doesn't resolve, um, administration of IV steroids um, is recommended. Um, and as I mentioned before, like, um, in cases where you might want to pre-medicate a patient before an IV iron infusion, those patients are usually just given IV steroids. Um, antihistamines are not recommended. So just a slide here looking at um, oral versus IV iron and the advantages and disadvantages. So I think oral iron, it's super easy. Um, it's inexpensive. It's, you know, felt to be very safe. Um, but it can take a long time to replete your stores. 
Um, and it's hard to take a pill every day for a lot of people. Um, in terms of IV iron, it, it is very effective. You have rapid correction of your iron deficiency with one dose. Um, uh, and there's no GI side effects. Um, disadvantages to oral iron, as I mentioned before, can be like constipation or stomach upset or diarrhea for some people. Um, and adherence can be really challenging and it might require a very long course. Um, and disadvantages to giving IV iron where you need to you know, be able to put in an IV, um, give in a medical um, environment. And people, you know, there is the po rare but possible risk of allergic or infusion reaction. And it's obviously more expensive than oral iron. Um, so indications for IV iron. So, um, you know, I think that if a patient has persistent iron deficiency and they haven't been able to take oral iron either maybe due to adherence issues or inability to tolerate the oral iron due to side effects, that um, that certainly is an indication for IV iron. Um, if they're having severe ongoing blood loss, those patients are likely candidates for getting IV iron, um, along with sorting out why they're having ongoing blood loss and trying to stop that. Um, <clears throat> conditions that interfere with absorption, so patients who have a history of gastric surgery, celiac disease, and there's a lot of literature on this topic about patients in infl with inflammatory bowel disease that um, they should be patients who receive IV iron. Um, coexisting inflammatory states that interfere with iron homeostasis. So, you know, even in cases like in patients with a chronic kidney disease, they might be tried on oral iron first and they might correct with that. But if they don't, we should think about um, IV iron. And a lot of times this is going falling on the nephrologists who are managing this, but it's just something for us to be aware of. Um, so response to um, iron supplementation. So you typically see um, reticulocytosis occurring in seven to, day, seven to 10 days of initiating iron supplementation. And the hemoglobin will slowly rise after one to two weeks after therapy, increasing typically by two, gram, um, by a point, two points after three weeks and hopefully normalizing by six to eight weeks if the source of blood loss has been controlled. Um, and ferritin and transferrin will also gradually improve. So when do we check labs? You know, a lot of times when we're caring for patients in the hospital or in clinic and you've identified iron deficiency and you started treating for it, um, you know, uh, it's an appropriate time to think about rechecking labs if you started someone on oral iron to see them back in about two weeks for um, rechecking their hemoglobin count and looking for reticulocyte count response. And importantly, seeing if they're tolerating oral iron, because if they're not, um, it might be consideration for other therapies like IV iron um, versus um, kind of talking about what, if it's adherence or um, what the issue is with taking it. Um, and then in IV iron, um, it's recommended that iron studies are not rechecked until four to eight weeks after giving the IV iron. Um, I mean, you might want to be checking hemoglobin levels before then, especially if you're worried about ongoing blood loss. But um, uh, IV, uh, IV iron, you can wait four to eight weeks to check iron studies um, to see how a patient responded. Now, uh, going into the last part of the talk, I just wanted to um, talk about kind of some clinical questions and some literature updates. Uh, so. Uh, this is looking at oral iron prescribing is more better. So uh, in this kind of stem here, there's a 28 year old woman who has menorrhagia and a hemoglobin of 10 and a low ferritin at nine. She's prescribed oral iron. How often should she take it? Um, there was an article from um, the Lancet in 2017 looking at oral iron absorption of women with iron deficiency. And there was two groups people who got daily versus twice daily dosing, and then a group that got daily versus every other day dosing. And what they found was that um, there was no difference between the patients who got iron every single day and got iron twice a day. So giving them iron twice a day did not make their iron stores, uh, they did not absorb it any better, and they did not have higher iron stores. Um, and patients who got every other, the patients who got every other day, iron actually absorbed more. Um, and interesting, they actually checked hepcidin values in this study, and the hepcidin levels were higher in patients who got daily dosing. 
And I think that's interesting because we know when hepcidin is high, you're not absorbing as much iron. What about vitamin C? I've definitely told patients that they should take their iron with orange juice or like a vitamin C tablet. Um, and it's theorized to create a more acidic environment to promote iron absorption. There was a JAMA study in 2020 that looked at this. Um, and it was basically done on um, about 500 patients at a university in Shanghai with iron deficiency. And they randomized um, into two groups, one who received iron and then one that received iron and vitamin C. And the findings were equivalent at eight weeks. So the hemoglobin and ferritin levels were no different between the two groups. So this supports that um, you know, vitamin C doesn't help you absorb more iron. It doesn't hurt you either. So if a patient likes taking their iron with orange juice, that's not an issue, but um, not probably absolutely critical to have. Um, this is kind of just a quick question. I definitely had had, um, you know, times in my uh, experience working with patients in the hospital where people thought, well, we don't need to give them any iron because they already got blood products in the hospital. So um, but this is a case of a patient who's here with, admitted with a GI bleed. She has an initial hemoglobin of 6.5, gets a unit of packed red blood cells, and her hemoglobin improves to 7.5. Um, and she's found to have iron deficiency with a ferritin of 10. And on um, GIs consulted, and she has a non-bleeding ulcer on her EGD, stabilizes and doesn't have any more bleeding. And my question is, should she get iron after blood transfusion? And again, kind of, um, you know, I calculated her iron deficit here um, using the Gamzoni equation. And it looks like she still has a deficit of about 900 milligrams of iron. Even um, and so this is before the iron, the blood transfusion. Um, and so, how much iron is in a packed one unit of packed red blood cells? And that's about 200 milligrams in one unit of blood. So she still needs about 700 milligrams of iron to correct her deficit. So you know, in this case, I think it would be appropriate to give the patient if she's in the hospital and she's here with a peptic ulcer, probably a couple doses of IV venifer, for example. Um, and then I'm um, just kind of going into some of the literature on, um, on iron and heart failure. So in a case, this is a 75-year-old man who's admitted with systolic heart failure. He's improved with diuresis and guideline-directed medical therapy optimi optimization. Is there a role for iron in reducing his readmissions? Um, this is a study that just came out last year in The Lancet called Affirm AHF. And it um, randomized uh, about 1,000 patients with systolic heart failure and iron deficiency. And iron deficiency was defined as a ferritin less than 100 or a transferrin saturation of less than 20%. And they either got IV ferret carboxymaltose, which is the iron formulation that's typically used in all the heart failure studies, versus placebo, which was normal saline. <laughs> um, and the patients who got IV iron had reduced heart failure admits at 52 weeks. Um, and there's kind of like the numbers on that. And I just, uh, I just attended um, the ACP conference this past uh, last weekend, I guess, for this year that was virtual. And um, there was a talk about heart failure updates for the internists. And um, Dr. Yancey, who does a lot of the updates for the American College of Cardiology, um, he did a talk at the ACP conference and he was really um, pushing that we should be evaluating for iron deficiency in our patients with systolic heart failure in the hospital um, and thinking about giving them IV iron. Um, even though our, up, our guidelines don't totally reflect like a, a very high grade level of evidence for doing that, he was really advocating that we do that and thinking that the guidelines are gonna change. Um, so something for us to be aware of and kind of some other data about IV iron and heart failure, which. I think is interesting. There's kind of an older article from the New England Journal of Medicine, 2009, called Fair HF, and this was a randomized double-blind control trial, um, <clears throat> looking at about 500 patients with systolic heart failure and iron deficiency. And again, they either got IV ferric carboxymaltose or saline, and they found that in the patients who got the IV iron, um, that they <laughs> they reported improved quality of life assessments and had improvement on their six minute walk test, which I think is amazing. Um, and this was also seen in a European heart failure study called CONFIRM-HF, which is a little bit of a smaller study, but it basically showed the same results. 
And I think where people kind of get, conf maybe not confused, but where there's like discordant data, but there's um, there was this other trial in JAMA from 2017 looking at, sorry, it says um, IV iron, but it was actually giving patients with systolic heart failure and iron deficiency oral iron or placebo, and these patients did not do any better. And I think that's the main point here is that, you know, we know that patients who have iron deficiency and heart failure, that it's typically due to anemia of chronic disease, that they typically have anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency. And it's thought in those patients that they oftentimes need, won't correct without IV iron. And so I think, um, again, it just kind of is more evidence that like, if you are gonna treat iron deficiency and heart failure, that you should think about giving IV iron and also not giving it until they're stabilized because uh, it is some amount of volume to be giving them. Um, so typically it should be something that's thought about at the end of discharge. And if you're working with a cardiology team, kind of talking about doing it um, beforehand to make sure that they agree. <clears throat> And these are just kind of the current up, the current guidelines. So, you know, the European Cardiology Heart Failure Guidelines, they recommend giving IV iron to symptomatic patients with heart failure. And um, that's a level A evidence um, class 2A recommendation. And the U.S. guidelines currently, and these are from 2017, they recommend IV iron in patients with heart failure and iron deficiency. And that's a level B evidence right now. But I think that might be changing. And that's kind of what it sounded like in Dr. Yancey's talk. Um, and, you know, we don't recommend a specific IV formulation. It could be IV ferric carboxymaltose. That's what's used in all the heart failure trials. But what I was reading in the guidelines for American College of Cardiology, they also use formulations like IV sucrose or venifer. Um, and we don't really know about the role of iron in, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but there is studies that are coming out about that. Okay, kind of wrapping up here. Um, what about IV administration and infection risk? Uh, so this is a 65-year-old woman admitted with infected hardware after back surgery, and she's coming in with a, a low hemoglobin. Her ferritin's on the higher side, but her transparent saturation is 16. Should she receive iron? Um, and, you know, there is, you know, I think the practice, the culture is not to give IV iron when patients have an active infection. And why is that? Um, you know, it is thought that, you know, we know that bacteria needs a certain amount of iron to thrive. And so it's thought that maybe giving patients IV iron could make it harder for them to recover from their infection. Um, and we know that patients with disorders with high, um, with iron overload, such as hemi uh, hemochromatosis might be more at risk for infection. So, you know, it's cultural practice not to give IV iron in patients with active infection. There's not a lot of great studies about this. <laughs> I found this article from the British Medical Journal from 2013, and it was a systematic review and meta-analysis assessing safety of IV iron. And it looked at about 10,000 patients in 72 studies, but they found that um, giving IV iron was associated with increased risk of infection. It didn't say, it wasn't looking at patients with active infection and giving them IV iron. I haven't been able to actually find any studies related to that specifically, but there's a lot of literature about this in um, patients with kidney disease and still like the guidelines are recommending their cultural practice is to withhold IV iron if the patient is, has an active infection until they're recovered from their infection. And then um, I think this is the last one here, IV iron and serious adverse reactions. So 50-year-old um, woman receiving IV iron, she starts to have facial flushing and back tightness. Um, the infusion is paused and symptoms resolved, um, and the infusion is completed. Uh, what's the risk of severe reaction or anaphylaxis with IV iron? And um, there's basically a large systematic review and meta-analysis from uh, this Mayo Clinical Clinic proceedings from back in 2014, a long time ago, I guess, at this point. But it basically looked at um, giving patients with either, either received IV iron or some other preparation. And it looked at about 20,000 patients and a total of 10,000 who received IV iron. And just the main take home point was that there was no death or anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis reported in any of the trials where patients received IV iron. So I just. Points. Um, uh, I think I might, I can hold off on the take home points there. I think we might, might be out of time or.
thanks, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, perhaps we can just leave the take home points uh, up there on our on our screen. Um, we do have a few questions here in the queue. So with our remaining five minutes or so, um, yeah, let's go ahead and skip to those. Great. Great. Um, I think actually your talk anticipated several of the questions and you have answered or at least partially answered many of them. Um, you spoke to this a bit, um, but there is this question um, with anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency. Do all of those patients need a GI workup for cause? Um, and with those cutoffs, it raises question about a lot of workups needed. Um, so again, maybe just final thoughts for, for cut off, cutoffs and, and workup, especially when you have a combo with chronic disease. Yeah, I, in my reading about this and also listening to a lot of experts um, talk on podcasts, and so much of this data is from the uh, chronic kidney disease population and ESRD population, where they see so much combined anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency. And in those cases, they are recommending an occult GI workup, um, especially if the iron deficiency is severe. So I think a, a careful history, um, assessment for risk factors, and then referral, you know, based on uh, the patient and the clinical situation is appropriate. Great, thanks Thanks for your thoughts. Um, and just a comment here, thank you for somebody from our audience who mentions um, that ferric carboxymaltose is available to give at the Providence Infusion Center. So perhaps still questions about hospital formulary, but does appear available um, for outpatient infusion. Thank you. That's great, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Um, and then you spoke already with regard to um, many pathogenic bacteria requiring iron for reproduction and concern for infection. Um, sounds like data is pretty limited, but take home message might be um, avoid IV iron in the setting of acute infection. Uh, any other thoughts or corrections on that, Dr. Hutchinson? Yeah. Um you know, what I read a lot from, again, like Dr. Auerbach, who's really the expert in this field, um, you know, expert opinion is to withhold IV iron until the infection is resolved. And everything I found was kind of like meta-analyses, like there's not like a head-to-head -head trial about this. And I think it's just because the cultural practice is not to use IV iron when there's active infection. I think it's probably okay to use oral iron, but like a lot of those times the patients, if they're actively inflamed, they're just not going to be absorbing it anyways. Um, because uh, the whole like hepcide and upregulation causing blockages of oral iron absorption and decreased release of iron from macrophages. So I don't know how helpful that would be. And obviously adding to a lot of pill burden for patients who might already be on a lot of medications too. Great, yeah, thanks. That's an excellent point. Um, and just to clarify though, it does sound like in general, the notion of giving IV iron in the hospital is often appropriate. Um, and in fact, maybe even encourage, particularly in our heart failure population. Yeah, I think that setting up an outpatient IV iron um, can be challenging for mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in the outpatient setting. So I think if a patient meets criteria for it and they're going to be in the hospital, it's definitely reasonable to consider. <laughs> Great. I, uh, as primary, uh, mostly a primary care physician, um, thank you for that. Uh, handle it while they're there. Um, I guess just a, a little bit of an addition to that, you had mentioned perhaps some concern for things like um, fluid overload and being a little bit careful when they might still be in the acute exacerbation of CHF. Um, any more thoughts on, on risk um, and also whether you see with the transfusion with the um, iron transfusion reactions, which is generally the case as opposed to allergic reactions, if you do see things like in the, the trolley realm, like a transfusion related lung injury um, with IV iron, any thoughts there? Um, I think the, um, from my reading about this, the transfusion reactions are thought to be exceedingly rare, you know, less than 1% of patients who receive IV iron could be at risk for even a mild transfusion reaction. And when you look at um, one of the main points I got took away from my reading about this topic was that patients are at so much higher risk 
for a reaction to blood products, like if they're getting a packed red blood cell unit compared to IV iron. Um, but I think there's just such a strong culture that we're just still so scared and hesitant. I mean, nobody wants to cause a patient harm from like a medication we give them. Like I totally am also, uh, you know, very exceedingly cautious about that. But I think um, we give so much blood in the hospital and we still have this in, in underlying fear of giving IV iron, which is actually probably much safer than giving um, blood products. Um, I don't really, I didn't really read anything about trolley. Um, mm -hmm. But patients can have subjective dyspnea with the transfusion reaction. Great. Great. Um, I am going to give you just one last question. I see we're at the top of the hour at 9 o'clock. Um, a lot of media-driven messaging lately on vegan and veggie diets and the fact that one can obtain iron without a supplement. All can be obtained with plants and lentils. There is talk that food industry has duped us into thinking we need to eat animal protein for proper iron stores. Um, so the question I think is, what are your thoughts on getting adequate iron from a vegan or vegetarian diet, particularly without additional supplementation? Um, I actually was going to include something about this on my like myths and facts, and I did read a couple articles about this, and I found you know, discordant results like Dr. Auerbach, um, he, he notes that patients who are strict vegetarians are at higher risk for iron deficiency. Um, but I think if someone's eating a careful, a balanced diet um, and really uh, uh, being conscious about like their iron intake or, or if they are taking a daily supplement, like a multivitamin that has iron in it, you're probably going to be okay. I also read a, um, another study that was like a German study looking at um, athletes who were runners, and it was randomizing athletes who were vegetarians, vegans, and omnivores, meaning like they're eating meat and like vegetable products. And um, in that in that study, uh, no one was iron deficient, but there were people in the vegan group who had low iron stores. So I think it's a risk. Um, it's you know it seems like uh, that the iron that's in vegetarian or like vegetable sources is not as well absorbed. But I think if you're conscientious about it, you probably do okay. That being said, I think if you have a patient who is on a restricted diet, it is definitely reasonable to assess their iron stores because they might benefit from supplementation. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, we are at time there. Thank you so much, Dr. Hutchinson, for your careful review of the literature and your very practical points for a common medical problem. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye.